Hello YouTube, this is Cyber Aquarius, and this is part four of my series Nitrates in the Aquarium. Guys, this is probably going to be the most boring part of this series, but I have to talk about these following methods. I'm saving the best for last. Part five is going to be really exciting, but I need to get through this part four because we're looking at reducing nitrate concentrations in the aquarium, and I don't want to leave out any of these methods. So I'm going to briefly talk about them because I need to keep this video under 15 minutes. In part two of this series, we talked about a weekly rate of production of nitrates in the aquarium. I showed you guys how to determine that. And now that we're going to start using one of these methods to remove nitrates, we want to know its effectiveness. We want to determine if it's working or not. So we're going to uh, place one of these methods or media into use within our aquarium. And then we're going to conduct a series of new tests to determine at the rate at which these nitrates are being removed. Your weekly rate of production is not going to go down unless you remove fish from your aquarium or unless you reduce the amount of times you're feeding. So technically your weekly rate of production will not go down. This new test will not be your new weekly rate of production. This new test, we need a, a new term or a technical word to establish what this new test is, and this will be our baseline. Well, this new test, which is conducted the same way as the weekly rate of production test, you're going to perform a nitrate test on one day, and you're going to wait one week without any water changes between the first test and the second test, and you're going to conduct the second test, and the difference between the second test and the first test will be your baseline. So let's say, for example, you determine that you had a weekly rate of production of 10 parts per million on your aquarium. And then you start making use of one of these methods. And you conduct this second series of tests, and your nitrates only rose by 8 parts per million. It went from 10 parts per million to 18 parts per million. So right there, this tells you by your baseline that your nitrate removing method is removing 2 parts per million of nitrates from your aquarium every week. And a lot of people think that your method or your media is going to remove your nitrates immediately within a, a couple weeks. Well, it doesn't happen that fast with some of these uh, methods or media. It takes longer for these bacteria to establish than they do in the uh, aerobic environment as it does with our uh, nitrifying uh, nitrosomonas and nitrobacter. So we have to give it time, but you'll see over time that your rate of removal is slowly catching up to your rate of production until they level off and you'll uh, eventually be left with very very low nitrate uh, concentrations in the aquarium. Well I hope that makes sense to you guys about weekly rate of production and a baseline but if you got any questions about it just send me a private message don't mind answering your questions. Okay now we're going to start talking about uh, some of these methods. Well I mentioned algae in the title of part three, but unfortunately I had to omit the content of algae from that video because it was running too long and I couldn't get it to upload. So I'm gonna mention algae now at this time. But as you guys know, algae can uh, grow within the aquarium whenever our nitrate concentrations are as low as five parts per million. It's also uh, directly caused by phosphate concentrations as well. But Macroalgae has been used for decades to, to help remove nitrates and phosphates from the aquarium. And the first method I'm going to talk about is an algae scrubber. Not to be confused with an algae scrubber that you scrub the inside of your aquarium's glass with to remove algae, but an algae scrubber uh, is a filtration device. They've been around since the late 1970s. It was invented by Dr. Walter Addy. And these initially were very expensive because Dr. Walter Addy would build these on an individual basis. So not everybody could afford them, but today Aquarius are building them for themselves. And I think you can even buy uh, an algae scrubber for, from some different companies. But basically what an algae scrubber is, is it's a filtration device where green filamentous algae is allowed to grow on a rough surface and this algae attaches to this rough surface and it needs a light source as all algae does to, to grow but this light source 
is either placed on both sides in most units or on one side in some units. But water is allowed to flow through this algae through either gravity or through upflow using an air pump and air bubbles causing water currents to, to flow up through this filter. But as water flows across this green film of this algae, it essentially scrubs the water free of nitrates, phosphates, and even some heavy metals such as copper. Now, the initial cost of an algae scrubber, you know, it can be a little bit expensive. It requires a light source, which if you're using compact fluorescence, you know, you're going to have to replace your lights on about a yearly 12 month to 18 month basis. And it requires a good bit of maintenance. Your algae has to be harvested on a weekly basis because if the algae is allowed to grow too thick on this rough surface, then it basically, basically blocks out this light from penetrating deep into the attachment points where it's held to this rough surface. And these attachment points will begin to die off and the algae will break away from this uh, algae scrubber and float off of it. And the water's not effectively flowing through the, the algae and being scrubbed. Well, I'm not going to talk anymore about that. You can type in algae scrubber in your favorite search engine. And there's lots of information online. I do know how to build one. So if any of you have any questions about that, you know, I have my own method of building one. But just know that they are effective. And since we're talking about algae, I also want to mention uh, the macroalgae chatomorpha for the reef aspect or the saltwater aspect of the hobby. And chatomorpha is an excellent macroalgae that can be used in a refugium. We talked about what a refugium was briefly in part three, but basically a refugium is an external aquarium where uh, different, different things are allowed to be placed in a refugium such as, as a refugium specific substrate like Fiji mud or Lingsi's uh, Miracle Mud. And briefly I want to talk about this. We talked about deep sand beds in part three, but this uh, Miracle Mud or Fiji Mud goes well beyond what a deep sand bed does. It provides for anaerobic conditions as well as microfauna uh, such as copepods and amphipods for your reef aquarium which is an endless supply of food for your fish and it also releases uh, desirable trace elements and minerals into your aquarium. I know that the, the substrate needs to be either boosted or replaced you know on a yearly to you know 18 month basis it really depends on your bio load but uh, these refugium specific substrates are excellent at keeping nitrates low and this chatomorpha uh, inside the refugium it does a fantastic job of removing nitrates and phosphates but guys keep in mind that the best way to use chatomorpha is to allow it to to not get too compacted within your refugium. You want it to be loose enough to where it'll sort of rotate and kind of move around inside the refugium because you don't want it to become, to become clogged with detritus and particulate matter. Uh, there again, Chetomorpha needs to be thinned out on a regular basis, but if it's in a refugium, there's really not much work to it. And also, uh, live rock rubble within a refugium. Guys, live rock is nature's perfect filter medium. Um, live rock, it provides for aerobic conditions on the external surfaces of the, of the rock for your beneficial bacteria to remove ammonia and nitrite. And also deep within the rock, it provides these anaerobic conditions, these low oxygen environments, which we talked about in part three. And these anaerobes will exist within these anaerobic uh, environments within the live rock. It'll produce nitrate and produce harmless nitrogen gas, which escapes through your aquarium surface back into the atmosphere. So live rock, guys, hands down, nature's most effective way at removing nitrates from the aquarium. I know back in the mid-80s, I've seen uh, many people using live rock and protein feeding alone, which is known as the Berlin method. That's what I used on my 75 gallon reef, but that's a very effective way at keeping nitrate levels extremely low.
For one, the, night, the protein skimmer removes these uh, organic compounds from the aquarium before they have a chance to break down into nitrogenous compounds. So protein skimmers are also a very good way at uh, keeping nitrates low because you're removing these compounds before they have a chance to break down, break down through the nitrogen cycle into nitrate. Live rock, like I said, hands down nature's most perfect media. All right, I'm going to quickly talk about a couple more methods in this video. Um, a sulfur biodenitrator. These uh, came about in wastewater treatment plants. I work for a, uh, the local water municipality here in Georgia. I'm not going to tell you which county, but we employ uh, a sulfur biodenitrator that's probably taller than my house to effectively remove nitrates from the aquarium. And they found their way into the hobby here over the past several years. They're relatively expensive, but guys, um, they do work. They are effective at removing nitrates in even a highly stocked aquarium. Uh, basically, it's, it's a filter, like almost like a carbon reactor or a fluidized filter reactor, where a sulfur-based media is placed inside this reactor and this bacteria grows on this sulfur media. And it consumes the sulfur media as its source of carbon. And it also utilizes, or these, this bacteria also utilizes nitrates uh, for, their, for their nitrogen source. So a sulfur biodenitrator, really good. But I have a buddy that was using one and he complained of a rotten egg smell in his uh, aquarium room, his fish room. So keep that in mind. They're relatively expensive and can produce foul odors, but they do work. I did it again, guys. I just went over 20 minutes. So I'm not reshooting the first half of this video. I'm going to redo the second half. But the Aquarium Pure, if you've been on YouTube for any amount of time, you've seen the ads on Aquarium Pure. I've never used it before. I know what it does. I've read about it, watched the videos, as I'm sure most of you have. But there's too many mixed reviews for me to really put my faith and trust in something like this. And, but I will say that it is very expensive. Um, the unit that I looked at for my 150 gallon aquarium was over $300, I think it was $340. It requires constant dosing of a carbon source such as vodka and you have to test the water coming out of it and make adjustments and whatnot. But if any of you have used it, put down in the comments below, let us know if you've had success with it. I'd like to think that it works. Like I said, there's a guy locally here that loves it. So just tell us your experience with the aquarium here if you've used it. All right, uh, a fluidized media reactor. Now I do believe in these. I've never used one myself, but they're both for freshwater and saltwater aquariums. A fluidized media reactor can be either a cylindrical type of reactor or a square type. I've seen both. But it's basically a reactor in which a specific type of media is placed in it, such as Dr. Tim's NP Active Pearls, which by the way, in my opinion, would be the only type of media to use in a fluidized reactor. Uh, Dr. Tim's NP Active Pearls are the only 100% carbon-based media. And what that means is uh, other types of media use fillers, uh, these polymer fillers that do not uh, biodegrade. And this beneficial bacteria will grow on the surface of these pearls. And these pearls are fluidized within this reactor, which means they tumble and are allowed for all the surface area to be exposed to the water. And these beneficial bacteria will grow on these pearls and utilize these pearls as their source of carbon. They require a ratio of 50% carbon, 10% nitrogen, nitrate, and 1% phosphorus, phosphate. Well, as these bacteria consume these pearls, they produce a biomass. And this biomass is removed from the aquarium in the form of a protein skimmer or in a mechanical filtration pad. In the saltwater aspect of the hobby, the return of the fluidized media reactor would be hooked into the protein skimmer and this biomass would be removed through skimming from the aquarium. In the freshwater or saltwater, you could also use a, a mechanical filtration pad, a very fine micron 
filtration pad, which this biomass would collect onto this filtration pad through the return of the, uh, the media reactor. And the only thing is this, uh, this method by using the filtration pad, the filtration pad has to be cleaned on a daily basis pretty much or replaced because this biomass begins to build up in this uh, filter pad and will die. And once this biomass dies off, it releases the, the nitrate and phosphate back into the aquarium. The cost of a, a fluidized media reactor is relatively low when compared to a sulfur bio-denitrator or an aquarium cure. And I believe in them. You don't have to adjust the flow rates going through it. Just a little bit, just to make sure that the media is tumbling properly. But you don't have to dose it because the pearls themselves are the the bacteria's carbon source, and like I said, they're very economical. I think you can buy a unit for a 150-gallon aquarium for around $40. The pearls themselves aren't that expensive, but they need to be replaced uh, every so often as they become consumed by this bacteria, typically within about six months to a year. But fluidized media reactors, I believe in them. I recommend them. All right, a couple more, the last two things I want to talk about, and then I'm going to end this video, is uh, chemicals. Guys, chemicals in a bottle that were uh, designed to be added to your aquarium and remove nitrates, don't use them. There's three, three problems with this. Number one, you're going to be reducing your nitrate concentrations too rapidly, subjecting your fish to nitrate shock. Number two, this doesn't solve the source of the problem. This is just a quick fix. And number three, it I think uh, it costs around $20 for a bottle of this nitrate removing chemical. And like I said, it's not a, a solution. It's only a band-aid. So you're going to have to keep purchasing this chemical over and over. And for $10 more, for $30, you can buy four liters of uh, denitrification media that never has to be replaced and doesn't break down. Um, and it does what the aquarium pier is supposed to do. It removes nitrates. Uh, another thing I want to mention are these nitrate removing sponges. They work. They uh, remove nitrates from the water column. But there again, they also have to be replaced. I'm not bashing them. I mean, I know a lot of systems uh, like the, uh, the new uh, Innovative Marine uh, Aquarium you know, they, they come with a nitrate removing sponge. That's fine, but you can utilize the denitrification media to remove your nitrates and you won't have to continue to purchase a nitrate removing sponge. All right, guys, well, I think I've covered everything in this video. Part five will be coming up very soon. And like I said, that's the icing on the cake. That's going to be the video to watch. If you have any comments on, on uh, part five, part four, this one, Put them in the comment section below or send me a private message. Guys, I appreciate your time watching. Until next time, this is Cyber Aquarius saying take care. Have a good one.